going, guys? Are you like more than halfway through this boot camp, right? So I'm gonna skip past this preamble that you guys have seen enough times already. Uh, we're into module three out of four of the RNA seq section. And today we're gonna talk about expression and differential expression. So the lecture is not gonna be very long, um, but we're gonna spend a bit more time um, taking you from your alignments to actually estimating the abundance levels of transcripts and genes in these demonstration data sets and then um, seeing if we can calculate differential expression metrics uh, for our two conditions. Uh, so that's where we are in uh, the course. And then for this module, we're going to talk about how you go about uh, estimating expression of known genes and transcripts. Uh, later, we're going to talk about how you would get estimation for potentially novel isoforms. Uh, we're going to briefly review some of the differences between so-called uh, FPKM expression estimate approaches versus the raw count strategies uh, and look quickly into the differential expression methods and then talk a little bit about some of the downstream interpretation uh, steps that you might do which unfortunately we don't really cover very well in this course because we just kind of run out of time. Uh, but we can talk a little bit about that. So you guys have already sort of started doing this yesterday, looking at the alignments from your first sets of RNA-seq data. And we looked at a view very much like this in IGV, right? Um, <clears throat> and we were talking about how with I, you can already start to kind of think about whether this is an ex highly expressed gene or not, if you've seen sort of a lot of genes and you can say, oh, that's a lot of coverage or there's a lot of reads aligning to this gene or not. And we looked and determined whether we saw three prime bias. Uh, in this case, you see it much worse than the example we were looking at yesterday. There's like a lot of coverage here that kind of tails off as you get towards the, the three prime end of the gene. Um, Sorry, it gets towards the five prime, end, five prime end. It tails off. It's biased towards the three prime end. And you could say maybe this is a down-regulated gene because you have more coverage in the top condition than in the bottom condition. But that's, like we said yesterday, a little bit of an oversimplistic view of things. It's not really um, kind of statistically solid to do that. So we do need like a formal approach to this. And probably the most commonly used I think this was introduced in the first RNA-seq paper, or a version of it, is the RPKM or FPKM measure. <clears throat> Mostly you hear about FPKM now. RPKM was used first, and it referred to the reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads. And really the only reason we switched to talking about FPKM was because um, rather than thinking about things at the single read level, we thought of, started thinking about things at the fragment level because we had two reads per fragment when we started doing paradigm sequencing of the fragments. So it's basically the same concept, but you're not counting the two reads of a paradigm read twice. You're counting them once as a fragment. Uh, but the, the principle is the same. And the basic idea here is that first... We hope that in RNA-seq, the relative expression of a transcript is proportional to the number of cDNA fragments that originate from it. But even just casually thinking about it, you'll realize that um, the number of fragments is, is biased towards larger genes. So you can't just say like gene A and gene B and compare the total number of fragments if gene B is three times as long. Because that transcript, even one copy of that transcript, will break into more pieces and potentially be sequenced in more reads than this smaller gene would with one copy. So we have to deal with that, the fact that the size of the feature matters. And then another kind of obvious problem is that the total number of fragments is related to the total library depth, which is arbitrary, right? You can just keep sequencing. So if you sequence condition A to a million reads and condition B to two million reads, and you don't account for that, any kind of differential expression 
estimate you come up between those two conditions is, is going to be flawed, right? So this FPKM attempts to account for both of these issues simultaneously. And it's a pretty simple formula, right? You have the counts or the number of mappable reads or fragments for your gene. And you're basically dividing by the total number of fragments in the library and by uh, the number of bases in the gene or transcript or whatever the feature you're looking at is. And then the problem with this is you get this usually a tiny fractional number. So we multiply by 1 million times 1,000 or a billion to make it work out to this per thousand bases of gene per million reads of library. And that's really just a convenience so that the numbers are something that are more uh, convenient to work with. And there's a lot of discussion about how to calculate FPCAM and how to interpret it uh, on Biostars. <clears throat> so Cufflinks produces an FPCAM estimate, but it's a lot more complicated than that. It's actually really complicated. So you have to be a little bit careful that not all FPKMs are created equally. Um, you can and we do sometimes implement a very simplistic FPKM calculation where we literally just take the reads, align them to genes or transcripts, and do the calculation on the last page. Sometimes we do that. But more often we use software like Cufflinks that tries to take a much more sophisticated approach. So it's not just trying to account for um, the difference in library size and the difference in gene sizes, although those are incorporated into the method as well. But it's also trying to deal with things like the uncertainty of mapping, where you have a read that could apply equally well to different isoforms. And it's trying to figure out a good estimate of all the different isoforms for a gene locus, despite the fact that there's all this uncertainty about where each read maps. Some reads are really clearly belonging to a specific isoform because maybe only that isoform is the only one that has that exon or that particular junction between exons. But a lot of times, the different isoforms that are expressed from a locus, they share a lot of the exon content. They'll, they'll all use exon one, two, and three. And then one of them will use exon four. One of them will skip four and use five. And then one of them will have like a slightly different UTR or something like that, right? So there'll be these like subtle differences. And Cufflinks tries to assemble transcripts in a way that it can get at that information. So they provide this figure in their paper that's quite complicated. Just at a really high level to summarize how it works, um, they take the, the map alignments or fragments, and they construct these bundles of fragments that are overlapping. And then they look for mutually incompatible fragments. And then fragments are connected in an overlap graph, and then the isoforms are inferred from the minimum paths required to walk through that graph. And once you have those paths, then they do some fancy probabilistic statistics to assign um, estimates of expression for each of these isoforms as defined, defined by these paths. So here's a relatively sim simple example that they provide where you have these uh, fragments and they look at how they overlap and they basically they try to identify these mutually incompatible fragments. So there's this yellow fragment that doesn't overlap with the blue fragment, which doesn't overlap with the red fragment and vice versa. All these gray fragments overlap with some someone else and between the yellow, blue, and red. <clears throat> and then they basically construct a path that goes through these different possibilities. So the isoform could involve these early fragments and then go down through this unique bit of red here, or they could go through these early fragments, go through this blue, probably exon, and then to the end, and so on. And from that, they try to create a a picture of what the likely isoforms are in this assembly. And they're doing this genome-wide for all these different uh, bundles of fragments where each bundle is kind of roughly corresponding to a gene locus. And depending on which mode you run cufflinks in, they use 
they may or may not use information from the known transcriptome. So if you have a GTF file of a well annotated um, genome where we kind of have an idea of what all the genes are, it will try to use that information to guide this process. But you can also run it in a mode that says like, I don't know anything about what my transcript transcriptome looks like, just figure it out from the data. And it uses this approach to try to do that. Once you have these isoform definitions, which could be totally novel and just made up by couplings, or they could be guided by what we know about the transcriptome. Um, it goes back and tries to assign reads or portions of reads to, to each isoform to get some kind of concept of the likely abundance of each of these different isoforms in that sample. And it tries to make use of things like the fragment length distribution, right? So it knows or you can give it the uh, mean fragment size and standard deviation of fragment size for your library. And it'll try to say, okay, I have this alignment and I have these different ideas of what the isoforms are. Which of those isoforms is this fragment most likely to come from, given that I know the fragment sizes are on average, say, 200 kilobases? So with this one fragment, or considering isoform A, maybe it maps to exon 1 and exon 6. So an isoform that involves all the exons in between would mean it was maybe several hundred bases apart, or a thousand bases. And it might say that's unlikely given the fragment size. This fragment is more likely to belong to one of the isoforms that skips all those intermediate exons. See how that logic kind of work? So it's trying to be quite clever and basically use all the information that it has available to it to make the best guess of where each fragment belongs in terms of these different isoforms in the sample. So you get expression estimates. They're expressed as FPKM type measurements, but they've come from this very complicated probabilistic model. And then you can try to estimate differential expression between two samples or between, ideally, a large number of samples for condition A and a large number of samples for condition B. And the way it does that is by looking at the variability in uh, fragment counts across the replicates. So that's kind of standard statistics, right? You're looking at variability across all your replicates in condition A compared to condition B, and you're looking at both sort of the average distance between expression levels in these two conditions, but also the variability within those conditions. So if they're very different and not very variable, they're more likely to be differentially expressed. But it also tries to work in an idea of this um, uncertainty in the alignments themselves. So the fragment count for each isoform, it's estimated as before in the last step. But as it's doing that estimation, there's varying amounts of uncertainty that go into the estimates. So transcripts that have a lot of shared exons and very few uniquely assigned fragments are going to have greater uncertainty. So that example that I described at first where you have, let's say, two isoforms and they're basically identical. They share all the same exons, but they have this one tiny exon at the end that belongs to one isoform and not the other. The vast majority of the, the reads or fragments for, those, for that gene locus, you don't know which of the two isoforms it comes from, right? Because they align to exons that are shared between the two isoforms. So there's less certainty in terms of which uh, isoform those fragments belong to. So that would make it harder for differential expression to be observed between that gene and maybe another gene because you're less, or especially if you're looking at the transcript level, you're less sure about what the actual transcript isoform level is. And so the algorithm tries to combine these estimates of uncertainty for the alignments as well as the, the cross-replicate variability into a single model um, to estimate variances and then determine whether these differences are statistically significant between uh, genes across your set of samples. So when we go through the lecture, or sorry, the exercises, the first thing we're going to run is, is cufflinks. But then before we run cuff diff, we're actually going to run cuff merge. 
And maybe you can guess why this is necessary based on what we've already talked about. So for each sample, cufflinks is doing this thing where it's trying to infer the transcriptome, basically, depending on which mode you run it in. Um, it's trying to say for this sample, which transcripts are present and how are they defined in terms of their exon exon structure and so on. If you do that process for two samples, you can't guarantee, in fact, it's almost certainly likely that the assembly of transcripts is going to be a little bit different. So now when you're trying to say, is there a difference in expression level between these two samples, you don't have an apples to apples comparison, right? The transcripts have been potentially defined quite differently. So you need to merge them together. So cuff merge basically takes all of your cufflinks assemblies across all your different samples and creates a single consistent assembly. So it's almost like another approach to this would be instead of running cufflinks individually on all your data, you could create like one giant pool of all your RNA data and use that to try and get an understanding of all the transcripts that are um, present in your pool of samples and then define that as your new GTF file and use that for um, cuff diff. But that's not usually how you do it. So usually you run cufflinks on each sample, you get a sort of predicted assembly of transcripts from each and then you merge them together to make one consistent representation of the transcriptome across your pool of samples. It also does a few other things. So it pools or it filters out um, problematic transfrags. So there are known kind of issues where there'll be like a huge spike in coverage. Um, it could be for a biological reason, but usually it's like a mapping artifact where just like a lot of alignments pool there. And that kind of creates problems for uh, cuff diff and cuff links. So cuff merge will like remove some of those po possible artifacts. Uh, like I said before, you can also provide a reference GTF to merge the novel isoforms that Cufflinks predicts into the known isoforms, uh, and that can sometimes really help, and that's what we're going to do today. But in the end, you're going to get this um, assembly GTF produced by Cuff Merge that is uh, suitable for use with CuffDiff, and that's going to let you kind of compare apples to apples across all your samples. If you have one sample, no, you don't need to run it because you'll just have the one um, transcriptome assembly from cuff links and you'll get expression estimates from there and you'll just stop there. Yeah. So we were talking about variant sequencing. Would this apply also to sequencing? Yes, uh, you can use single end sequencing with cuff links. Um, certain information will be unavailable to the model, right? Like the um, fragment size distribution is going to be thought about differently and, and so forth, but it will do its its best. I do think cufflinks is quite, especially now over the years, has been quite optimized towards paired end data because that's really what most people have and what they've probably been developing the method with. Um, cufflinks has gone through a lot of developments. It's been like maybe five years now and multiple, many versions have come out and they've changed it quite substantially over the years. So it matters also which cufflinks version you're running. Yeah. Yeah. All samples across all conditions. That it's okay, it doesn't try to like, it doesn't try to harmonize in the sense that, let's say, I mean this is the, actually the sort of intended use case. Let's say you're comparing like brain tissue to uh, skin tissue or something. They're very different. And they're going to have quite different transcriptomes. They're also going to probably share a lot of stuff too though. When you run couplings on each of those, the transcriptome gets kind of defined and you want to know which transcripts that are defined in this sample are the same as those in this. But if, it, if there's a unique isoform that's only expressed in brain tissue and not in skin tissue, that's okay. It'll, it'll define that. The, the merge GTF will have a representation of that. But it doesn't mind that only maybe one sample or one condition has that, that isoform. Yeah. 
it, exactly. It's a union, not an intersection. Yeah. Yes, you can shoot. Yeah. Yeah. So say you like run several or uh also experiments and you have several yeah, yeah. you get bought from the first one, you can then use for further contact assemblies the one that always be get bought or can you just make uh reference to get the contact That's a good question. Good, yeah, it would be something to consider. I mean, I think it would depend. I would tend to think for human it wouldn't be necessary because we have quite, a, you know, now quite comprehensive representation of the, the transcriptome of all things that are ever expressed. It's probably not 100% complete, but it's pretty good. Um, if, if I'm trying to do novel isoform discovery, it's, it's a different thing. But if I'm trying to, you know, get good estimates of known genes and known transcripts, and I would probably still start with like the ensemble GTF, just because you're kind of guiding it towards what is really well established. It, and it sort of may prevent it from kind of going down a funny path, because this is a really hard problem that Cufflinks is trying to address, and the data it has is actually not that great. Like two by 100 base pair reads with 100 million reads is not what you want to assemble a transcriptome. It's, there have been papers published showing that it actually worked pretty terrible. So it's good that they're thinking along these lines and they're trying to do their best, but I wouldn't take you know, 10 RNA-seq libraries, run cufflinks and cuff merge and say I have a good representation of the human transcriptome at that point. I would much, much more trust what has been developed over the last 10, 20 years through you know, like length cDNA sequencing and things like that. <clears throat> okay. Cummerbund. So when you guys are done with CuffDiff, we're going to use an R bioconductor package called Cummerbund, which is also part of the, the Tuxedo suite. Uh, and this is kind of a convenient way to sort of jumpstart analysis on your differential expression results. They basically create a lot of functions to generate commonly used visualizations for expression and differential expression. So you can get things like MA plots, if you're familiar with those from the microarray days, uh, volcano plots, clustering, PCA, MDS plots, heat maps. Uh, you can get these nice gene or transcript level plots that show the structure of the genes. And this is especially useful if Cufflinks has defined new transcripts and you want to visualize what they look like and the expression levels of those new isoforms. Um, so we'll show you some examples of, of that output. And we're going to go through this in detail in the lab, so this is just kind of like a quick sneak preview. Uh, this is like what I was talking about. You can make these kind of like quite nice looking plots very quickly that have like a chromosome ideogram and all the isoforms that were predicted by cufflinks. And then you can pull in the isoforms, say, from Ensemble to compare what was predicted to what's known. And you can get, like, um, conservation tracks from UCSC. So it's quite, it's quite powerful for creating nice visualizations that are kind of, like, figure-ready for a paper. So alternatives to FBCAM. Uh, it's by far not accepted that this is the only way you should do things. There are sort of two major camps. Uh, one that is really probably led by the cufflinks crowd. Uh, they're probably the most outspoken about their approach, obviously. Um, but it, it is very widely used and regarded. Um, but there are a lot of other people that say, for differential expression analysis especially, that you should just use raw read counts um, with the right statistics. So instead of calculating an FPKM, you just assign the reads or fragments to a defined set of genes or transcripts. So this doesn't work if you don't know what the genes and transcripts in your genome are. 
But if you do, like in the human genome, for example, uh, you can determine the so-called raw counts for each gene or transcript. The transcript structures could still be defined by something like couplings. So if you wanted to use couplings to define the transcriptome and then switch to a raw count-based approach, you can do that. And actually, in the latest version of the Tuxedo Suite, they now directly support that within their own tools. Um, so even they recognize that sometimes for differential expression, you want to use these count-based approaches. <clears throat> We're going to use a tool called HTSeq Count. Um, there are different modes of running it. Uh, we're going to go through this uh, in the lab. You can tell it whether your data is stranded or not, um, and how to deal with sort of overlapping alignments, how to assign them, whether to summarize at the exon or transcript or gene level. Uh, you give it a GTF file. There are some important caveats to this transcript analysis by HTC count. Um, and strangely, the author is actually not that supportive of using it for transcript level estimation. For some of the same reasons that cufflinks estimation is challenging. So where you have like these two isoforms again that basically overlap almost entirely and just have like a little bit of unique content between them, your ability to come up with unique counts for that difference is really hard. And so the count based approach kind of breaks down a little bit for that. So a lot of people use it mostly at the gene level. If you're just interested in straight differential gene expression. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so TPM is a kind of variant of FPKM. It stands for transcript per million, I think. Um, it's a way of doing the let me describe this right. You're kind of doing the library normalization, but not the gene size normalization. So you can use it to compare abundances of transcripts within a sample. Uh, and some people like it for that to just get an idea of like what are the highly expressed versus lowly expressed genes within a condition. Uh, but I don't know that it's recommended to use for cross sample comparisons. Uh, so counts, yeah. There's a Biostar, or sorry, Seek Answers post that you might want to read if you're going to try transcript level analysis with the count based approach. So which should you use? Um, for me, FPKM, I use it because I like to leverage the benefits of the Tuxedo Suite, which is quite well developed. Like if, if you want to have this complete workflow that lets you do things like de novo transcript identification. Um, it's got the visualization stuff built in with Cumberbund. Uh, the FPKM measure itself is kind of convenient for visualizing, for heat maps, for calculating fold change. It's much more alike or in line with like a GCRMA normalized value that you would get from like an Affymetrix experiment. I kind of like, I could take these FPKM values and just like feed them into the same pipelines I used when I was analyzing microarray data. Whereas a count is a very different thing, right? It's just a raw count of reads and in and of itself it's not that useful. But there are some really robust statistical methods for differential expression that take counts as input. So a lot of the like really statistical crowd is focused on developing these different statistics to do a good job of really identifying which differentially expressed genes are significant based on the counts. Um, they tend to have uh, the capability to handle more sophisticated experimental designs. So there are count-based differential expression packages in R, for example, that can handle like time series experiments or um, experiments that have like many different conditions with complicated relationships between them. Cufflinks is like slowly adding more and more of these features over time. So I would say it's like kind of gaining parity in the ability to deal with sophisticated experimental designs. Another advantage is just computational. Um, especially in the past, 
Running the tuxedo suite takes a lot of time. It's very computationally intense. Um, the more samples you do, you know, that just like increases sort of linearly. If you have one sample, it takes maybe a couple days to run through all these pipelines. And now you have 100 samples, that's hundreds of days, right? So you need a big cluster to get it all done in, in a couple days. And then when you go to do the cuff merge and differential expression in the past, once you got above a certain number of samples, because it was trying to do so much, it would just like run out of memory, it wouldn't successfully complete. So the count-based approach, you're really synthesizing things down to a very simple matrix, basically. Like you run it on each sample, it's quite quick, and then you build a matrix that is like sample by gene, and it just has a count value in it. That doesn't take any room to store, and it's not hard to compute on. You can load it into R in like one second and run most of these um, count-based statistics in, in no time at all. So it could be used in cases where you had like really large RNA-seq data sets that you would have a really hard time pushing through Tuxedo. But again, having said that, like within the last maybe six months, they've really tried to deal with this by adding yet another tool um, called CuffQuant, which converts um, your cufflinks output for each sample into a much more efficient binary representation which CuffDiff can use that allows you to run CuffDiff on much larger numbers of samples. So they're kind of addressing that limitation. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to show you one and I can list off a few like edge R is the one that we're going to use. Um, but there's BC and yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Lima is a package that you can use for differential expression on account based data. The main interesting thing is you can use the describing how they point that and upgraded it. Yeah. In the past, you probably had to do like some transformation of your data before Lima, but I think. So we have, is, that, is it live yet, the, so the, we're doing a re, kind of review of RNA-seq analysis method that Malachi has like gone through and compiled some crazy list of current tools and recommendations, including probably a, a long list of um, account-based tools. And we're going to provide links to that. I mean, it's going to be available on the same way. Okay, so here's a couple options that I just mentioned, DEC and Edge R. Uh, there's a working example of, of code for this, uh, you know, as part of this um, set of tutorials. Uh, DEC is another one that's actually, I think, developed by the same guy that developed HTC Count. But there's a, there's a bunch of others, and yeah, we'll post those on the wiki soon. So. I would say it's still the case that probably multiple approaches are advisable. So in our pipelines, by default, we always run both the cuff links, cuff diff style approach, as well as the HTC count and edge R approach. And there's, you know, there's pretty decent overlap between these methods, but there's also a lot of stuff that is unique to each method. So depending on what your goals are, a lot of the times this is like hypothesis driven research, right? We're not looking for the definitive answers so much as like clues or uh, potential experiments to test in the lab. And you really don't want to miss out on all of these potential predictions because of some idiosyncrasy in how cufflinks works that because of some alignment challenge there was like a weird fragment bundle and it like threw it away so you won't get any um, idea of estimation for that locus or that gene or transcript. So by using a few different methods, you kind of hedge your bets that you won't miss anything biologically important. You'll probably also bring more false positives along, uh, but you can test on those in downstream analysis or experiments. So for example, one gotcha with um, cufflinks is that 
there are parameters that affect um, like the max bundle fragment size. So when it's looking at all your alignments and building these bundles that sort of correspond to gene loci, it says, okay, there's like this crazy amount of alignments here. This is probably expression of a, of a gene that's from this one genomic location. And I'm going to make a bundle out of it. But it has a parameter that says if this bundle gets to be more than, let's say, a million reads, it's going to cause problems downstream for computation just because of the way cufflinks works. So we're going to assume that that's an artifact, that it's unlikely that that many reads would align to one place in the genome. It's probably like a low complexity region, like a repeat, where tons and tons of reads just pile up there. And it creates this big spike, and I don't trust it, and it's going to cause computational problems, so I'm going to toss it. And it'll get marked as, I think they call it high data or something like that. And it doesn't get an FPCAM estimate. So you have no idea what the expression of that possible gene is now. You just have this vague uh, status. And lots of times you don't notice that, right? Like you'll go through the, the cufflinks and cuffdiff output, and cuffdiff won't will be, it'll be invisible to cuffdiff because there's no FPCAM. So there's no way that it can calculate a differential expression. And in the expression output, you know, it's quite common to sort of sort on FPKM or on um, the status. So it has these different status. And usually you look for, I think it's like the OK status. And you'll basically lose these high data loci. And a lot of times they are artifacts. They're just like problematic regions for alignment. But almost every time I've looked, there's also been like 10 or 20 genes in there that are known to be just really highly expressed genes. And you throw them away. And sometimes I've seen in cancer samples where it was like, an amplified gene that was like overexpressed and probably driving the tumor, and that's why it's so highly expressed. But it failed this max bundle size parameter, which you probably didn't even think about when you were running cufflinks. Um, and you know that's we've noticed that, and it's like oh crap. So we go back and like bump that up. But of course, there's a cost to that. As you increase it, every time you run cufflinks, it takes way longer to run. It uses way more memory. So you have to like come up with this balance, like what's practical on our cluster, given that we're going to run hundreds of samples through it, can we afford to bump this up for every one of those? Or do we have to do it at a lower setting, then look for problems, and then rerun certain samples? So that's an example of how you could lose an interesting biological observation just from the way that cufflinks works that you wouldn't lose if you also had like a count-based approach to kind of hedge your bets. Yeah. So when you do it when you run both cuffings and HMAPs, is the overlap similar to what they show in this picture, or is it? Yeah, yeah, it's similar. I think we, we do it maybe in this exercise, if you go through all the way to the end, all the optional stuff. Of course, here we have this like toy data set that's sort of small. But even there, I want to say it was like at least 50% overlap. But usually it's, it's, usually it's better than that. But there's always a pretty substantial non-overlap as well. Yeah, like I say, if we go, we go all the way to the end. So you have to do like all the cummerbund tuxedo-based approaches, and then all the count-based approaches, and come up with your two lists of differentially expressed genes, and then I think almost the last thing in the lab is like, you go to venue.org and create a Venn diagram. It's done sort of internally. So you get out your differentially expressed genes that have right, taken. Could you repeat the question? Uh, so the question is um, for the count based approaches, 
then we also need to think about um, gene, <coughs> gene size and library size. And the answer is yes, of course you do. And then so she's asking, well, how is it really different from F2 and F? Uh, it's not different in the sense that they both try to deal with it. The difference is that with the count base, you never get the normalized expression value out that you can then go and do something else with. You just get whether the gene is differentially expressed and a p value. But it's still, the only information you have about those genes is still the raw count. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But like the, right, the normalization to, to library size and gene size is internal to the statistic. So it's taken into account when it's determining the p value. But at the end of the day, you just have the counts and the p value. Like gene size, yeah. So you don't actually need to take gene size, gene size into account because you're only ever going to be using the count to compare tissue A to tissue B. And in both tissue A and tissue B, the gene size is constant, so it kind of cancels out. So yeah, you get more counts because the gene is bigger, but all you're doing is comparing the value for that gene in one condition to the value for that gene in another condition. So it doesn't matter that it has a Probably okay. I think that sometimes if you manipulate the data, you may violate some assumption about the distribution of the data that the statistics of that pool are expecting. So I, I don't know that I would necessarily say it was always recommended. That's part of the some degree they are expecting like a certain way of reprocessing the data. And we're, I mean, we're only talking about gene size, but there's actually a lot of things that you could try to account for and they can have maybe unexpected effect on the distribution of the data. So for example, uh, Complink's also trying to take into account GC content. So they'll try to account for biases related to how GC rich or GC poor region is uh, from one gene to Again, that allows you to have sort of a more equal footing from gene A to gene B to gene C within a single data set. So when you look at the rank of genes from the most highly expressed to the most lowly expressed, it kind of makes sense. But when you're doing, when you're only worried about comparing tissue A to tissue B, again, you don't need to like account for that because they have the same gene A has the same GC content in tissue A as gene A has in tissue B. So again, count. So there's many, many factors that are counseling out, and the, the raw count people will basically say, you can't account for all of those factors. You're better off to just use RNA-seq in a relative expression context and allow all of these things to cancel. So my understanding is using the relative count would limit you for the downstream counts because then that's saying you're going to have a compensation for the genes or anything. really geared towards people that are doing differential That's really what it's I mean, there's been probably like 20 papers published comparing these different approaches. And I want to say that everyone I've seen just considers the application of differential expression. So just straight, I want to know which genes are significantly differentially expressed between my two sets of conditions. Should I use count base? Should I use that and base? And so on. And they come to different conclusions, and nobody really says a firm answer either way. And most people kind of, you know, end up with the lowest common denominator solution, which is to run both. But you're absolutely right that once you start thinking about more sophisticated analyses, like co-expression analysis, X analysis, or then you need you need a value to to start with.
So I've put in this section called like lessons learned from microarray days. This is less of an issue now as it used to be, but it's still an issue. Like often I'll have collaborators come and they're really excited about RNA seq and it's gonna you know solve all their problems and they're gonna make all these amazing biological discoveries and they propose to sequence um, their cell lines and they would like to do one replicate for condition A and one replicate for condition B. And that's going to cost about $5,000. So they're like, wow, that's expensive. Um, but, you know, we'll get a lot of data and we'll learn a lot from that. But you see the problem here, right? Like, mic microarrays to RNA-seq, this transition, hasn't changed anything about the need to consider biological variability. So, there are some people that obviously recognize this. I mean, the MARC lab has a nice tool for doing like power calculations for your RNA-seq experiments. Um, and there are some good posts about study design and the need for biological replicates. Uh, but basically, there's no reason why you need any less biological replicates from RNA-seq than you do from microarrays. In some ways, you need more because you're actually measuring a lot more. Um, and this comes into the question of multiple testing correction. Are you guys familiar with the idea of multiple testing correction? Everybody, pretty much. Um, basically, the more attributes we look at, the more likely it is that we're going to see differences between the treatment and control groups uh, by random chance alone. Right? So when you had 30,000 genes on your array, it was already a problem. Given the certain amount of random variability, if you compare five samples from condition A to five samples from condition B, every so often by chance, there'll be a, a significant difference between these that is actually just random fluctuations in, in the data. And so multiple testing correction methods attempt to correct your p-values or your statistics uh, for this well-known phenomenon. When you move to RNA-seq, you're adding like orders of magnitude more tests potentially, right? Because now you have not only like the tens of thousands of genes and the hundreds of thousands of exons, but you have all the complexity of the trans transcriptome. You have genes, transcripts, exons, but you have also unique junctions. Every single exon-exon junction that's uh, known or novel that is predicted from your data. Um, you might have retained introns that you think are a, a real or potentially interesting biological phenomenon. You have other species of RNA genes that probably weren't on your typical array, like microRNAs and link RNAs and so on. So you have a huge multiple testing problem. And if anything, this would probably require more data to, to get around more replicates to get around rather than less. Some cases have an answer to both questions. Some cases they don't. So when you're talking about pooling samples, are you talking about pooling biological replicates? Yeah, so let's say we had a treatment for cell line because we didn't want cell line to be able to populate. So we take 10 plates and we burn it in one test and then run that for 10 multiple replicates. Yeah. So we don't, this is not every replicate, but that could be take 100 plates, 10 samples. We can mm -hmm. deposit them in 10 individuals to normalize biological replicate variability. Yeah, I mean, if people do do this, I think it can be appropriate in, in some circumstances. I think in some ways, um, methods like couplings are kind of doing that in silico in a way with this coupling step. You know, like they're recognizing that you have imperfect or incomplete sampling of each sample, and so there's um, this concept of uncertainty in the estimate for each transcript built in. And together you get the single representation of the transcriptome and then you go back and try and reassign probabilities to that merged transcriptome. But yeah, I, I don't know, we don't ever do that merging biological replicates, but I have seen it done. Yeah. I mean I think if you have really small RNA seq libraries like in 
older games, maybe it would, would have made more sense where you're getting, you feel like each one is less a complete representation of anything. So a lot of the variability you're seeing there is really sam insufficient sampling problems. And that would help you with that. Yeah, so I think less than two hundred ninety nine. So I think the five thousand dollars you spent on the value has ninety nine samples. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is the last slide in this section. Just to remind you guys that, you know, once you have your expression estimates or your differentially expressed list of genes, there's of course this whole downstream set of applications. And that's really the topic for an entire course, and actually probably the Canadian Biomechanics Workshop Series offers such a course, uh, but we don't have time for it here. Uh, <clears throat> but really the expression estimates and differential expression estimates that you get out of you know, one of these pipelines can be fed into a lot of the existing analysis pipelines that, that we might have used in the microarray days. Uh, we provide a supplementary R tutorial that's just sort of optional extra there that will help you to get your cufflinks data into R and manipulating it and show you how to, for example, do some clustering and make some heat maps. A lot of this functionality is also provided through the Cumberbund package, which we will go through. Um, let's see. Classification analysis, that's a common application of RNA-seq data, at least for us. So where we're looking to maybe build a signature that predicts um, outcome between uh, different types of tumors or that could distinguish between benign and malignant uh, expression signatures, that sort of thing. And I think RNA-seq data is quite powerful for those kinds of approaches because it does give you such a comprehensive representation of what's going on. I did this exercise where I compared the ability of these different technologies to correctly classify, um, for example, breast cancer cell lines into their different subtypes or into um, drug responders versus non-responders. And we compared RNA-seq data, um, microarray data, copy number data, proteomics data, a whole bunch of different data types, and really RNA-seq was the most powerful. It just had the most kind of signal to noise. So I think it's really good for that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it would be machine learning on, let's say, for example, the gene and, and transcript expression levels, where you have, let's say, 10 samples that are benign condition and 10 samples that are related condition, and the FPKM values, for example, for each gene are features of the machine learning. And then the classification is allowed to further from the new sample that produces the data. Right, exactly. And we use those first, I hopefully not 10 and 10, hopefully hundreds, but to build a model, and then yeah, you get classified and use unknown samples based on the expression values that you measure from that, that sample to accurately predict whether it's or not. So I actually provide um, a series of tutorials on Biostar. There's four tutorials that kind of walk you through this for a microarray data set. And the reason it's for microarray data is mostly because you do need quite a lot of samples, and there aren't that many big RNA-seq data sets out there with good clinical outcome information that you can do classification on. But the, the methods are really exactly the same. So if you learn the methods on, like for example, this array data set, you can definitely just port them directly to your RNA-seq data. Pathway analysis, of course, is a common downstream application. Um, if you're looking for something just really quick and easy, there's things like web tools like David. I don't know that I would really recommend that, but it is like a really quick and easy thing. There are commercial solutions like ingenuity pathway analysis. Um, Cytoscape is pretty good for pathway analysis, and then there are many, many R or bioconductor packages. And if you go to this link, you can see like a list of them. Yeah, what, so the question is, what are sufficient sample sizes for classification? There's, 
we always say this, but there's no right answer to that question because it depends on kind of like the effect size. So if your two conditions are really, really different, like if you're trying to build a classifier that tells one tissue type from another tissue type, and they're very different tissue types, like liver tissue from brain you'll build, be able to build a very strong classifier on a very small amount, for example. Of course, that's not really a useful classifier because it's not hard to tell those tissue types apart. But yeah, roughly tens would be sufficient. When the, the difference between your conditions is quite significant. There are many, many genes that are totally unique to one and never observed in the other. That is not usually the case. Like at least for us in the cancer world, we're always being asked to build a classifier to tell you know, who's going to respond to treatment or not, uh, who's going to progress to metastasis or not, and you have maybe a 10 years follow-up, maybe like a pre-treatment, a baseline sample. Those kinds of differences tend to be fairly subtle. To build even like a marginally useful classifier, you might which I think is why it hasn't really moved into the RNA seq world that much yet, because nobody's had the money to build such data sets. But they're starting to come, and they're, they're going to be more and more common. And probably as soon as RNA seq moves over to like the X10 instrument, well, then you'll be able to produce an RNA seq data set of like what we're talking about here for a couple hundred dollars. Then I think you will start to see like clinical. The biggest RNA seq data sets I know of in human are like the TCGA for breast cancer. I think they're getting up to like four to a thousand. I usually use random forest, so that's why I made the random forest tutorial because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Um, it has some nice features. Um, it can take it's fairly good at taking any kind of variable as input, like a mix of categorical or continuous variables. Um, it has built-in feature selection, so you don't need to like decide ahead of time what you think the good features will be. It sort of just comes out of the method, and then features are ranked, so you'll see which features were most useful in the classifier. Um, it's pretty good at cross-validation that's built in. It has this out-of-bag internal cross-validation that does a really good job, in my experience, with predicting future performance on new independent test data. And this is something that trips people up a lot of times when they're doing machine learning or classification, where if you're not careful about your practices, you can overtrain and think like, oh, I have this great performing classifier, but then I go and test on some new independent data, and it doesn't work for and the reason is that you've overtrained on your original training data. The way Random Forest is set up, it kind of like takes that out of your hands a little bit because it's built into the method. So it's a little bit harder to sort of screw that up. But having said that, like the Weka package, we list as a good learning tool for classification. And it has this nice, like, kind of interactive mode where you can, like, it's actually graphical, and you can, like, import a data set. And then you can put all these different classifiers and then connect it to uh, a kind of uh, performance or accuracy estimator. And you can run your data set through like SEM and Random Forest and all these other methods and then get the performance estimates from each. And I've done that for several of my classification problems. And a lot of times there's many kind of equally performing methods. Like if you have real biological signal there, classifiable. Well, there's lots of machine learners that will, will identify it successfully for you. I like random forest, so. And for pathway analysis, what's your preferred choice? We do use ingenuity pathway analysis sometimes just because it has nice uh, graphical features for making figures. Uh, other than that, I would use one of the bioconductor packages, but it's I don't know which one I would recommend right now. It's been a little while since I've used one. Sorry? Is the commercial one? 
continuity. Yeah, a lot of universities will have like a shared site license or shared seat license. You can get access to it, but on your own, I wouldn't recommend it because it is expensive. Um, yeah, quick and dirty stuff. I've used David, but I think I mentioned before a lot of the work we're doing now is like um, N of one tumors where pathway analysis doesn't really make sense. You can't really do a meaningful pathway analysis on one patient. Um, so I haven't been doing a lot of pathway analysis lately. I know that you were talking about the I've had the same experience. I don't really know what the answer is. I, I usually try to steer PIs that I'm collaborating with away from pathway analysis as it's generally done. But it's, it's like this panacea, like, oh, we need pathway analysis. We'll find something amazing. But that's also been my experience. But you run a bunch of different pathway analysis. It's kind of like, you know, with cancer pathways, you're like significant every single time. And yeah. even with RAN data. I mean, I would say, like, I would, I'd like to map my differentially expressed genes onto pathways so that I can look for patterns and look for commonality. But I don't know that I would rely that much on any of the established pathway analysis packages. Like, I don't think that is the fundamental. Like, okay, we have this significant, this list of significantly rich pathways because they. I don't ever see that trustworthy. I would rather yeah, map the genes that are different to express on the pathways and basically come up with my own conclusions that may not be like statistically tested, but could be the source of hypotheses for experimental validation. Sorry? I haven't used it much, but I've heard good things. I mean, it's probably one of the most common and popular options. Right, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Ye
So when I think about network analysis, I'm usually thinking about um, you're kind of building your own pathways that are based on interactions between genes and proteins, right? So they could be literally like protein-protein interaction data, or it could be things like um, gene co-expression measures that say that these genes, kind of their expression moves together, so maybe they're related, maybe they're in the same pathway, but the pathways aren't defined by like canonical sources like keg or whatever. So there's probably utility in overlaying pathways or in integrating pathways that are kind of predicted based on your raw data, like gene co-expression or protein-protein interactions with these canonical pathways that have been defined by like you know, biochemical experiments or however they've been defined. But I, I really don't know what the next modules are about, so I think you'll have to wait and find out. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's it, actually. So we are going to, are we going to take a coffee break, Michelle? We've been doing a 10, 10.30 break, so we're going to go Well, maybe I'll just introduce where, where you're going to be working now. And I think it might take, make more sense to do the break and then, and then start the lab, the, the lab exercises. Uh, so you guys are moving on to this part of the workflow. So we're going to use cufflinks, as described here, to do transcript compilation, uh, basically to define the, the transcripts in each of your samples, uh, and then uh, cuff merge and cufflinks to um, identify the genes and assign expression levels to them. Uh, and then I think in this module we're also going to do cuff diff and cummerbund. I think we're going to do this visualization as well. Yeah, the data sets, we're still just continuing with the three um, UHR and three HBR. So it's, it's really not an ideal data set to look at for differential expression. We will find to differently differentially express things because these are very different tissues. So even though we have like so little data, um, you'll see differential expressed things coming out. What about the data set that you're using to make a difference? I guess it would be sort of similar. I don't know about how much. I think it would be on a similar scale in what you see with differential expression. Was that also focused to one chromosome? Or was it? Yeah, it'll be similar. It's really just, you know, to illustrate how to run the pipeline, but it's, um, you'll have to use your imagination a little bit what it'll be like with, you know, proper large data sets. So, yeah, why don't we take a...